Good morning. How is everybody doing today? Doing all right? Wow, look at this. The, the nativity put my bottle of water behind one of these wise men. <laughs> um, it reminds me, uh, you know, with the nativity, different people have different customs. Have you noticed that? Uh, what am I talking about? Anybody want to tell me what the different custom is? With the nativity scene? What's that? Waiting for what? Waiting to put baby Jesus in the manger until Christmas Eve, right? Or Christmas Day. Yeah, have you ever seen that? No. You never saw that? Okay, some people cover the baby. Yeah, yeah. Well, at the YMCA where I go, uh, and also when I was down in Boca going to that Y, it was the same thing every Christmas. The baby's not in the manger, not in the cradle there. And they, they take it out, and they hide it somewhere until Christmas Day. Then they put the baby back because they say, well, he wasn't born yet. And then I was talking to the people at the YMCA. I said, well, the wise men weren't there either, so take the wise men away. And Mary and Joseph weren't there yet either, <laughs> so you have to take the whole thing down, you know. But anyway, it's to each his own, right? That's, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, too, uh, my sermon title today is Two Beasts of Revelation 13. Now, you remember when I preached this, uh, was it last? No, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I can't remember from one week to the next what I preached about, but and neither can you, by the way. But, <laughs> but uh, you remember I talked about <clears throat> uh, Beethoven, 10th Symphony, and Mozart's uh, Mass Requiem, and it was unfinished. Uh, but <clears throat> So like them, I didn't finish my sermon a few weeks ago. But unlike them, uh, today I'm going to finish it. Amen? Amen. The best I can. But um, it's not an easy... It, but I told someone today... A couple of people, when I came in, I said, be praying for me t today because this is a beast of a sermon. <laughs> and it is, you know, to preach. And uh, I can't do it in my own strength. I have to ask God to help me. But here, I want to give you a textbook, if you will. And this is a smaller paperback version. We had some nice uh, larger versions with beautiful photographs or pictures and illustrations. And this is the great controversy. I've talked about this many times from the pulpit. And... To get the full picture of what I've been preaching about with Bible prophecy, especially this sermon today, you would do well to read this book. Okay, The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White goes through uh, the history of the church, prophetic history, even to our day, to the coming of Jesus, Okay, as it talks about in the book of Daniel and Revelation. So please, uh, it'd be good to read this this year as a, as a New Year's resolution to read this book, and uh, you'll be well informed, and it will supplement greatly what I've been talking about. Someone said, well, a couple people, what was the word, bewildered? I think that was the word. Was that what the word was, from? A couple people felt bewildered because it's a lot too absorbed, and it is, but it's important. We're talking about Bible prophecy in the days that we're living in today, so it would, we would do well to inform ourselves. Don't stay bewildered, okay? Get out of that bewildered mindset, and, uh, and uh, then you'll be able to not only know for yourself, but then teach others. It's very important. So this book, I can't promote enough, The Great Controversy. Of course, along with reading your Bible, and uh, between the two, you'll be well informed. And that's my purpose, to give you information so that you can be well informed and you can come to well-informed conclusions. Amen? You don't want to come, you know, mis you don't want to be misinformed. You want to be well-informed. Uh, yeah, so everybody looks so good. Glad you're here. I'm glad I'm back. Uh, my knee's getting much better, and uh, it's coming along. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your cards and texts and prayers and everything and phone calls and, and whatever else that you've been uh, keeping me in your prayers. And I've been keeping you in my prayers, too, so... Let's keep that up. All right, let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we're coming to you today, thanking you for another day of life, especially on this holy day, your Sabbath day, seventh day of the week, the day Jesus said was made for man, all of mankind. And we're coming to you today, dear Lord, because 
you said to remember you on this day, to remember this day. And, and this day as we remember you, we remember you as our creator, the God who created this world in six days and rested on the seventh. And that's why you've asked us to rest, to remember you as our creator, but also as our redeemer. So Lord, we're coming to you today remembering when many people are forgetting you, we want to remember you today. And we're asking that you would send the Holy Spirit, as we always do, to open up our hearts and minds. Lord, I can't preach this sermon today without you, but you can preach it through me. And you can open up all of our ears today that we can hear the truth. And the reason why you gave this message in both Daniel and Revelation to, uh, through Gabriel and through Jesus himself to John in, in the book of uh, Revelation and Gabriel to the book and Daniel to Daniel, you've given these messages not so we can be bewildered and, and not understand, but we can understand. And the Bible says that he who has an ear, hear what the angel says to the churches. So Lord, today we're listening. We have ears. We want to know what you think. We want to know the truth in these messages. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now, like in the day of Pentecost. Come like a rushing wind into our hearts and minds and flood us with your Spirit your Holy Spirit. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You remember the four kingdoms of Daniel, prophetic chapters of 2, 7, and 8. Quickly as a review, because you know, it's good to review. You know why? Because you've heard the saying, what is this saying, Carl? Uh, Fran? <laughs> Repetition, there we go. Thanks for getting me started here. Repetition deepens what? Impression. Have you ever heard that? Repetition deepens impression. So that's what we're doing here quickly now. So the first kingdom, Babylon, represented by the head of gold in chapter 2, and by the lion with wings in chapter 7, uh, represented the kingdom of Babylon. Now, it's not mentioned in chapter 8 because Babylon was not a major player at this point, point in Bible prophecy. Uh, having to do with God's people, so it's not mentioned. But in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, Medo-Persia comes next with the arms and chest of silver. Uh, and in chapter 7, it's, that kingdom is represented by a bear lifted up on one side. And in chapter 8, it's represented by a goat with two horns, but the horns are tilted, so one's higher than the other. And so this is representing the the alliance between the Medo-Persian, uh, Medes Empire and the Persian Empire with Kings Cyrus and Darius. And the Persian Empire became more dominant later on, and that's why the bears tilted up on one side, and that's why the horn is one height than the other. Are you with me? Okay. Now, Greece came next with Alexander the Great. There were four generals that took his place after he died, and that is represented also in chapter 7, by the leopard that has four heads. And in chapter 8, you have a goat, which represents the Greek empire, with the notable horn, the large horn between its eyes, that represented Alexander. And when he died, there were four horns that came up in its place that corresponds with the four heads of the leopard in chapter 7. You see how the Bible all connects those things. And so and then we go to Rome that came next as we look in history. And Rome came after Greece. And that's represented by the iron legs. And in chapter 7, Rome is represented by a beast with, excuse me, ten horns. It has iron teeth corresponding to the iron legs in chapter 2. And then finally, we go down to our present day. In Daniel chapter 2, there was a statue. that, In that statue, it had feet that were part iron and part clay. And also, we realize that as it talks in 7 and 8 about these last days, there was another horn that came up in both, it says in chapter 8 and 7, it was a little horn. It was actually the 11th horn on the beast that represented Rome in chapter 7. So it came out from Rome. We want to make that clear. And so we identified what this little horn was that came up from the 10 on the Roman, through the Roman Empire. And we answered that question by looking back in history. Now, 
you remember the seven churches of Revelation. They were literal churches that existed when Jesus gave the vision to John on the island of Patmos. And it also, as Bible scholars and theologians, there's a general consensus that they also represent different time periods in the Christian church. From the time of the book of Acts, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And for the first 300 years of the history of the Christian church, uh, Rome was the dominant empire that ruled over them. And they persecuted the church. They were not friendly to the church. And this is also represented by the beast in chapter 7, the Roman Empire. Now, things change, though, as we move on to the 4th century. And we remember that there was the edict given by the government and by the two emperors, Constantine and Licinius. And this is the edict that they gave. They said, in interest and security of the state. Remember that now. Remember that point. This was beneficial to the state, okay? And since it was beneficial to the state, they decided to grant to Christians and everybody the free power to follow the religion of their choice. And it goes on to say here that we also have conceded to other religions the right to open and free observance of the worship for the sake of the peace of our times, and that each one may have the free opportunity to worship as he pleases. This regulation, it was actually a law they were making here, uh, is made that we may not seem to detract from the dignity of any religion. Wow. Freedom of religion. Persecuted by and murdered by the hundreds, put to death by the hundreds and even by the thousands of Christians uh, for the first 300 years. Now there's a, a, a 180 U-turn and now they grant everybody to worship as they want. And that was the Edict of Milan. And remember we talked about, as we're doing a review here, this sounds an awful like, a lot like the First Amendment of the Constitution of our country. The first Ten Amendments was the Bill of Rights, and that First Amendment said this, Congress shall make no law. And you know, that's what Congress does. We have three branches of government, don't we? We have the executive branch, which is the president and his appointees and his cabinet. Then we have the judicial branch, which is comprised of the Supreme Court and lower courts. And then you have the, what's the last one here? Help me out again. The legislative branch, there we go. <laughs> I had a late night finishing this sermon today, so I'm going to need a couple of, couple of words uh, to help me with here. But the legislative branch, and that is the one who makes laws, and that's what Congress does, okay? Now, it says that Congress shall make no law, what? Respecting an establishment of a religion, or what? Prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So very much like the Edict of Milan, Religious freedom was, is given to, those, uh, to our country and to any religion or any group of people to worship as they see fit. Now, as I told you last time I preached, don't confuse religion in America or church in America with religion or church and state in America. You see? Because the First Amendment writes, no laws respecting or prohibiting any religion. But when you talk about church and state, that terminology is talking about that the government, the Congress would make laws that would respect or would prohibit the free exercise of religion. You see the difference now. So don't get Christianity or religion or church and country mixed up with Christianity or religion or church and state. Are you with me now, church? Okay, are you with me? So it's, 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 the, it's the making laws that either uh, respect, promote, or inhibit or prohibit certain things that we're talking about when we mention the terminology church and state. So that's what our First Amendment guarantees is the freedom of religion. And that was also back in the Edict of Milan. But I said before, you've heard if it's 
Sounds too good to be true, then it probably is what? Too good to be true. And just a few decades later, in the Roman Empire, in 380 AD, under Theodosius I, there was another edict, another law that was made, and this, this is what the law was. And look at this turnaround. We authorize the followers of this law. You see, their Congress, or whoever made laws at that time, they want people to assume the title of what? Catholic Christians. You see, that was a law that was respecting uh, a religion. Okay? And no matter what you would call yourself otherwise before this, when you had the freedom, as they gave you back in 312 A.D., now you had to call yourself by this name. You had to call yourself a Catholic Christian. And this is what Rome decided. And we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church here, okay? And it said, but for others, it says they will suffer. And, and I'm just, I'm going to read every word today because this is a review. They will suffer in the first place the chastisement of the divine condemnation. They were so sure that what they were doing was God's will you have to call yourself a Catholic Christian, that God's going to be displeased with you, and he's going to chastise you for not calling yourself by this name. And he goes on to say, and in the second, the punishment of our authority, this is the Roman government now, our authority, which in accordance with the will of heaven, you see, look at this, don't miss this. They thought that what they were doing was in the will of heaven. They thought this was God's will, that they make this law, they, they have mandate that everybody has to call themselves, by if you're a Christian, a Catholic Christian. And they said, you're going to suffer God's chastisement and also our authority, and we shall decide to inflict. So it doesn't say what they decide to inflict, but there'll be a punishment. They say not only from God, but also from the state. Now, let's move on here. So this was the beginning of the church-state alliance. Now, don't forget, we're not talking about religion and country. We're talking about state, mandated state, uh, mandates from the state that tell you how you have to worship, when you have to worship, and what you have to call yourself. So that's the terminology, church-state, and that's what it means. Now, so at this juncture, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, after, in the fourth century, became represented by the beast in Daniel 7, became the Holy Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, represented by that 11th horn on the beast in chapter 7, the 11th horn, which represented the Holy Roman Empire. See, there was a transition from a secular government to a secular religious government, a, 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 an alliance of church and state. Are you with me? Okay. And... This continued for over a thousand years, this alliance. In the time period of the Church of Thyatira, in 800 AD, Pope Leo III, he crowned Charles the Great, or also known as Charlemagne, he crowned him emperor of, the, not the Roman Empire, but what? The Holy Roman Empire, that church-state alliance. And in the time of Sardis, uh, over 700 years later, it was Pope Clement VII that crowned Charles V, which was a, a, an emperor. He not only was he an emperor, but he was a holy Roman emperor when he was deemed so by Pope Clement. And this happened in 1530 AD, right in the middle, in the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. So these, this is a list after Charlemagne of all of the emperors that were crowned and coronated Holy Roman Empires by the different popes that existed in their day. So you can see this church-state alliance for over a, a thousand years and uh, continued all the way to the time of Charles V, which I mentioned, and he was coronated as the Holy Roman Emperor in February 24th in 1530. So you can see this church-state alliance seemingly, seemingly benefited the church. Uh, you can see in this picture in, of the map of Italy, this illustration in 1494, you can see how much influence they had. And the, the, the emperors of the different countries gave them this landmass in central Italy 
and it was called the Papal States, and the Pope resided over these Papal States. But 1796, it's still there. And so for, for, for hundreds of years, this church-state alliance seemingly benefited the church. But you get to 1810, and where's the Papal States? They're gone. They're gone. And I, got, I was thinking about this. You know, in the beginning, they called Christians uh, the way. You've read that in the Bible, right? And then I believe it was in Antioch with the first place where they were called Christians because they were Christ-like. They talked like Christ. They, they, they lived like Christ. They, they, they taught like Christ. And they were called Christians. But what's interesting is that when Rome got involved with the church, they're no longer called the church or even the Catholic church. You know the word Catholic means universal? And that in itself is not a bad thing, really. I mean, even if somebody would call themselves a Catholic, a Catholic, I mean, a part of the universal Christian church. But here's, here's, the, here's the thing. It's not just called the Christian church or even the Catholic church. It's called what? The Roman Catholic church. You see, the Roman Catholic Church. You see, and I'm not here to offend anybody. I, I, I'm just here to present historical facts. These are the facts, folks, all right? If you want to come up with a different interpretation, let me know. If it's better than the one I got, then, well, hey, why not if it's, if it's factual? But you see, so, so, so in essence, when Rome and, 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 Rome and uh, the church had that alliance of church and state, Rome renamed the church, not to the... Christian church, or not people from the way, or Christians, they named it the Roman Catholic Church. Now they had a label on it. One country. They renamed the, the whole church for everybody who lived everywhere in the whole world. And, and this church, they went, to, <laughs> they went to, in Europe, and they persecuted people. They had a, uh, the, the, the Crusades. They came to South America and in Inquisitions, and they... I've been down there in Peru. I've seen those, those torturous uh, implements that the church used to try to convert people to Catholicism. I've seen it. And so, but, but the, what happened, it seemed like it worked for a while. The church became very brutal, but now all of a sudden, that church-state relationship is not very beneficial. And even the leaders, past and present, of the Catholic Church recognized that that was not a good idea. It was a mistake. And I read this by Pope John Paul II from the New York Times on March 13th, the year 2000. He said, the Pope said, we humbly ask forgiveness. He goes on to say, we cannot not recognize the betrayal of the gospel committed by some of our brothers. He's talking about the Catholic Church here, especially in the second millennium. He said, recognizing the deviations of the past serves to reawaken our consciences to the comp uh, compromises of the present. This is the Pope speaking for the entire church. And, and so he recognized that church-state alliance, it, it, it was not a good thing ultimately for the church. And even Pope Francis, the present head of the Catholic Church, in his comments about the, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church when he supported Vladimir Putin's invasion this year in February of this year of invading Ukraine, he said this. Brother, speaking to the leader of the, of the Orthodox Church there in Russia, he said, brother, we are not clerics of the state. What a statement coming from the, the, the leader and the head of the Catholic Church. They used to be clerics of the state, right? There used to be that church-state alliance, but now he's saying it should not be. We should not be clerics of the state. We cannot use the language of politics, but that of Jesus. Can you say amen? It's all right to say amen, because that's a, true, that's a good statement, isn't it? You agree with that statement? We should not be clerics of the state, and we should not use the language of politics, but that of Jesus. Do you agree with that? All right, so, so they recognize this, okay? Now, even the late Dr. Billy Graham, the powerful minister and evangelist, he said this. This is from an NPR interview or report in 2018 
and an interview that Dr. Billy Graham gave to Christianity Today back in 2011, he said if he can do things and go back in time and do things over, he said he would have steered clear of politics. Now, Dr. Billy Graham, he had personal interviews with 12 presidents in his lifetime, in his ministry, from Harry S. Truman all the way to Barack Obama. And he met with President Trump, but before President Trump became president, he was ill and he couldn't do that. So 12 presidents he, he, he had interactions with and meetings with and gave counsel to, but he said he would have steered clear of politics because why? He goes, I know I sometimes cross the line and I wouldn't do that now. You see, this clergy, we're not clergy of the state, that church state of lions, it's a fine line, it's easy to cross, and Billy Graham did, and he regrets that. He would have steered clear of politics, he said. And I want to review this because we're Seventh-day Adventists, aren't we? We're here. We believe we're God's remnant church. We've been called into existence to give a message, these prophetic messages, to a world that needs to hear them. What do you say? And it says this from the book Desire of Ages, page 509 and 510. It said, Today in the religious world, there are multitudes who, as they believe, are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly and temporal dominion. They desire to make our Lord and our Lord ruler of the kingdoms of this world, the ruler in its courts and camps, its legislative halls, its palaces, and its market places. I'm going to get my place here. They expect him to rule through legal enactments. There's people today that expect God, the kingdom of God, to be established through legal enactments. But the First Amendment of our Constitution says we're not going to make a legal enactment, a law, to either uh, 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 to favor or to be against an establishment of religion. That's not what we do, but people would like to do that. Enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not now here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in his stead to execute the laws of his kingdom. The establishment of such a kingdom is what the Jews desired in the days of Christ. They would have received Jesus had he been willing to establish a temporal dominion, to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God, and to make them the expositors of his will and the agents of his authority. But he said, speaking of Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. He would not accept the earthly throne. The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive, and on every hand were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Governments of the world and even right here in our own government. Yet, now look at this now, in spite of all that, yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemn the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. Now look at this statement. He who was our example, was Jesus our example? He who was our example, what did he do? He kept aloof from earthly governments. You know, just mull that over in your mind and chew on that a little bit. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I'm just presenting inspiration to you today, facts, and it's up to you what you're going to do, with, but pray about these statements. Not because he was, now look at this now, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men. It's not like Jesus didn't care what the government did or, or, or the injustices or cruelty that was going on in the world, no. But, but look what it says, because the remedy did not lie merely uh, with human and external measures. To be efficient, now we want to be efficient, right? Excuse me. We want to be efficient, right? The cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. You see, politics, legislation, is not the answer to make our country and our world a better place. It's Jesus in the heart. And when Jesus makes people better, then the places they live and the countries they live in will become better. What do you say? You see, that's the efficient way to do it. That's why I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher. I'm a minister of God. What do you say? 
It goes on to say, not by the decision of courts or councils or legislative assemblies, not by the patronage of worldly great men is the kingdom of Christ established, but by the implanting of Christ's nature and humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's why we need to be praying for the Holy Spirit, that God would change us. It's not by just knowledge, uh, but it's by the Holy Spirit transforming us into the image of Christ. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, John 1, 12 and 13. Here is the only power that can work for the uplifting of mankind. And the human agency for the accomplishment of this work is the teaching and practicing of the word of God. So when you look at the unfortunate experience of the Christian church, it, don't forget it started out as the Christian church uh, of the, with the apostles and the church fathers, but then Rome decided to get involved in church business and hijacked it, basically. And then it came with all its mandates and laws, and you got to call yourself this, you got to do it this way. And the church got caught up in it, just like Dr. Billy Graham recognized he got caught up into it, just like this John Paul II and Pope, uh, the, the present Pope, Pope Francis, they realized it not, didn't work out, it wasn't a good idea. And, and now what's left of the little horn? A little country. <laughs> it's still... A church state, by the way. It's only 109 acres. And it's only got about 800 people to live there. If, if you could, you know, describe to me a country on the face of the planet, a horn, a nation that's little than that, then go ahead. But you can't do it. Morocco's next with 900 acres. <laughs> but the Vatican, Vatican City, it's a sovereign church state nation still. But it's just a little one. It's just a little horn. And is this the end of the story? Is there more to the story? Was that little church, state, nation, that little horn, is it going to stay little? Or is it going to grow again? In Daniel chapter 7, I'm just going to read the highlights quickly now. We're going to move now. There's a fourth beast, okay? And that fourth beast had a little horn on it, right? We identified that as the church of Rome, the Roman Catholic church. And this little horn, it had ten horns, or this beast had ten horns, and it says there was another horn, a little one, coming up from them, that eleventh horn where you see the arrow. And a mouth-speaking great pompous words, the same horn was making war with the saints. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. He shall speak pompous words against who? God, the Most High. And he's going to persecute who? The saints of the Most High. That's you and me. And it goes on to say, and he shall intend to change times and laws, and he's going to rule for a time and time and half a time. That's back in Daniel chapter 7. Well, what about the first beast in Revelation 13? Because my sermon is the first two beasts in Revelation 13. So here's another beast, right? Or this, John sees a beast, and he has seven heads and how many horns? Ten horns, just like back in Daniel. He has a blasphemous name, he looked like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. All the characteristics, this first beast of Revelation 13, similar to those in Daniel chapter 7. It says, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, great authority. And look what it says here. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Stay with me now. I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. You see, this is when the church lost its power. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute, how this happened. And they worshiped the beast. And he spoke great things in blasphemy. And he reigned for 42 months. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. You see, the similarities cannot be missed. The fourth beast of Daniel 7, and that little horn. Now, the little horn's activity as the first beast in Revelation 13, they both have ten horns. 
They both speak words against God the Most High. They both persecute and make war with God's people. And they both rule for the same period of time. Now, I want to put a little asterisk next to that and explain that just for a minute. Daniel 7 said that the beast would reign for a time and time and half a time. That's three and a half years. How do I know that? You remember in chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was proud. He said, this is the great Babylon that I built. And remember what happened to him. Because of his proud heart, God humbled him. And what happened to him? It said that God gave him the mind of a beast until what? How many times passed over him? Seven times passed over him. King Nebuchadnezzar was humbled and lived in the forest of Babylon with the animals for seven years until he looked like an animal. His hair was long and, 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 and tangled and his, his, his fingernails grew and looked like animal claws until seven years passed and then God gave him his right mind again. Seven times, seven years. And this is the time frame we're talking about here. For three and a half years, beast of Daniel 7, and for 42 months, you got 12 months in a year, you go 42 divided by 12 equals three and a half. They both reign for the same amount of time. But I can't go into this too deeply now because we need to finish it up here now, but in Bible prophecy, when you talk about a day, it actually equals a year. And when you take three, three and a half years and you calculate it out to days, you come up with 1,260 days or 1,260 year time period that these two beasts reigned on the earth. In 534 A.D., Emperor Justinian, he came up with a book of laws and it was fully implemented in the year 538 A.D. And look at the conversation between Pope John II, not Pope John Paul II, but Pope John II and Emperor Justinian. They wrote letters to each other, and Pope John said to Justinian, you have preserved reverence for the See of Rome, that's the Pope, and have subjected all things to its authority. You see, this is what the Emperor of Rome did for the Pope of the church. He subjected all things to its authority. This see, talking about the Pope, is indeed the head of all churches, as the rules of the fathers and the decrees of emperors, the laws of emperors. You see that? The laws of emperors assert, and the words of your most reverend piety testify. And Justinian writes back to Pope John II, we have exerted ourselves to unite all the priests of the East, and subject them to the sea of your holiness. You see, the church had split, and you had the church in the east, and you had the church in the west. And now Justinian, the emperor, saying, we're going we're gonna to get them all together. He said, you are head of all the holy churches, for we shall exert ourselves in every way to increase the honor and authority of your sea. Now, this was in 538 A.D. The pope had total control of the church, and, and that church-state alliance and interaction with the, with the leaders of other nations was, was at its height. And, and look what happened, though. In 1798, exactly 1,260 years later, the three and a half years later, prophetic years, 1,260 literal years, Pius VI, he condemned the French Revolution and the suppression of the Gallican Church. That resulted from it. French troops com commanded by Napoleon Bonaparte defeated the papal army and occupied the papal states in 1796. In 1798, upon his refusal to renounce his temporal power, Pius was taken prisoner and transported to France. He died 18 months later in Valence. His reign over two decades is the fifth longest in papal history. You see, this is the deadly wound that the little horn received and lost its power. And the first beast in its activities 
In Revelation chapter 13, it's talking about this little horn power of the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican today. And the question we want to ask ourselves again, what is going to be the future here? Does the Bible tell us in the book of Revelation what is going to happen in the future? Yes, it does. I saw another beast, another beast, that first beast in Revelation 13 that we talked about representing the Church of Rome. But there's another beast now, and it says that he exercises all the authority of the first beast. Just highlight it now. He causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? Worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. 1798. The church, the Vatican, lost all its power. Now just a little horn, little country, insignificant. It no longer has the authority and power it once did of the nations, of the world. But it said there's going to have a, be another beast, another country, another nation to come along. And he's going to cause all the world to worship that first beast again. The Holy Roman Catholic Church. He's going to cause the whole world to worship it because this deadly wound will be healed. And he tells those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And it says that he would cause as many who was not worshipped the image of the beast to be what, church? Killed. You talk about laws and mandates to worship. And this is what we're talking about here by the government. And that no one may buy or sell except those who have the mark and the name of the beast or the number of his name. You see, there's going to be a church-state alliance again. That's what the Bible predicts. And it's going to be all the countries of the world are going to participate because all the world will wander after the beast, it says. Even our own nation. And you're going to say, oh, Pastor Pastor, we have the First Amendment. We, our Constitution, it says we can't make any law respecting an establishment of the religion or prohibiting the way people worship. But the Bible prophecy says those things are going to change in the nations of the world and here in America. You say, well, that's, that's absurd. Are you sure about that? It's already started, folks. It's already started. Now, I'm going to show you something here. This is this, is this year. Statements made by members of Congress. Okay? Now, I'm not going to show you their names. I'm not going to show you their party affiliation because then it gets too political and I'm not here to do that. I'm just here to pre present to you the word of God and the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, here's statements made by members of Congress this year. And by the way, I will tell you that there's, there's differences of opinion. And I'm going to show you three statements and all of these statements of, 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 from people from the same political party. I will tell you that. So you won't think that, well, there's just the differences of political parties. No. All of these statements are from members of Congress from one party, okay? Now look at this statement. We are seeing a resurgence. It's like a revival. It's really a Christian revival in so many ways. That's what I want to see. I want to see the church in America come to life and save this country. Because the church in America is the American people. Our Constitution was founded by Christian men, God-fearing men who knew the right thing to do, and they gave up their lives for our great country, and that's what we need to remember. People need to remember that. Now look at this other quote. The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation, talking about legislation by Congress, the, uh, the, uh, not the executive, I'll get it together. Legislative branch, there we go. Now look at what it says here. This is what a member of Congress said. The church is supposed to direct the government. The church is supposed to direct the government, right? The government is not supposed to direct the church. Well, they have it half right. <laughs> they have it half right there. But this church-state alliance, our country, and, and we're talk, not talking about, we're not talking about religion in our country or church in our country. We're talking about state legislation in our country, right? favoring or not favoring any, any establishment of religion. It says, that is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. It's not just in the Constitution. It's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. Well, it's true. 
You won't see the separation of church and state in the Constitution, but like we read in the First Amendment, Congress should make no law respecting the establishment of a religion and favoring one above the other. Can you agree with that? Now look what, he, from the same political party, right? A member of Congress. Look what they say now in answer to these quotes. I took an oath to defend the U.S. Constitution which states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion and prohibiting the free exercise thereof. While my personal faith is firmly in Jesus Christ, they're a Christian, okay, in Congress. And look what they say here. Our nation protects the right of each person to choose any faith, change their faith, or have no faith. That's been true from George Washington to the present. Our country, America, is great because we're the land of the free, can you say amen? to make our own choices, where the government can't mandate us in regards to our faith with God. That's just between him and us, and we don't need the government's help when it comes to that, what do you say? This is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We're in the feet, the toes of Daniel chapter 2, of iron and clay. We're living in the last days of Earth's history, where that little horn will once again become active, and the countries of the world will form an alliance, including our own country, according to Bible prophecy, and it will start to make laws that do respect an establishment of religion, and it will persecute and make mandates and persecute God's people, even to the point of death. Let's pray that God would hold back those four winds of strife that blowing upon the nations, so we have a little more time of freedom to preach the gospel because before we lose those freedoms, what do you say? Let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, it's a lot here, but you, it's all in the Bible, those 66 books. All, every word is inspired and given by inspiration of God, it says, including the ones we saw today. And Lord, what this should do, I believe, is it should help us. It's like a call to action. The call to action to reach out and to the hearts of lost men and women and even ch children who are ignorant of these things. But Lord, you have called us as a Seventh-day Adventist church out of darkness into a marvelous light. And Lord, we know that these prophecies are true, the sure word of prophecy. And dear Lord, we do ask that by your grace we could just take it to heart today, that we could focus and get our priorities straight and, and be involved with reaching out to people and sharing Jesus with them, sharing the truth with them. So, Lord, only by your grace can we do this. So just take all of us now as we're next. There's only a few weeks left in this year before we head into the new year. And we do pray that as we close out this year, dear Lord, we would make things right with you in our lives. That if there's any sin, if there's anything that's hindering our prayers, dear Lord, that you would reveal it to us. And that we would determine that as we end this year and begin a new one, we're going to be all in with Jesus. So, Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you for this church. This touches my heart, Lord. I, this is such a wonderful group of people, and I really mean that. Their love and concern for me and my family, and, and I for them, Lord. Uh, feel the same way for them, Lord. We need to be praying for each other. We need to press together. So, Lord, take control of this church. Take control of the Palms West Church. Take control of the lives of everyone who's watching online. And keep us safe and bless us until we see each other again. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.